Well, thank you all for coming. It's a great delight to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's, it's really been a wonderful experience. And the topic I want to talk about now, as many of you know, is loving kindness in times of adversity, which reminds me, I taught a retreat on Maui with Ram Dass, um, just a few months ago, and the title was something like this. I think it was Compassion in the Face of Adversity, something like that. And uh, the, the organizers, all of whom are very old friends of mine, would tease me because I gave the title every time something went wrong, like somebody's plane was late or they had to cancel, they would say, why did you have to mention adversity? It's like all your fault that something went wrong. If we could just turn the other way and pretend it doesn't exist and use a different word that is milder, kind of repackaging the concept, that nothing would go wrong. And I love that um, banter between us because I think it actually is kind of typical for the sort of messages that we get from the world around us when we're hurting, when we're frightened, when things aren't going so well, when we face difficult circumstance. There's often a, a hidden mis message that says something like, you should have been more in control. You should have been more on top of things. And if only you really exercise the control, the domination over life that you're really capable of, wouldn't be this problem. And so I think a great deal of a spiritual journey actually is stepping back from all of those messages and taking a really fresh look at the nature of our lives, the nature of happiness, the nature of love. What is strength? Is a kind of brittle resistance and resentment or endless seeking of revenge, is that actually strong? Where is happiness to be found? What about when we feel so alone and we feel so cut off and, and so isolated? Would not we be happier to make a connection with one another? Where does the truth lie? Is love actually kind of weak and foolish? And this is a lot of what my work has been around the topic of loving kindness because I read a book called Loving Kindness that came out almost 20 years ago now. And my great fear in writing that book was that people would mistake that notion of loving kindness, of compassion, as something sort of weak and foolish, a little bit simpering and saccharine, whereas really I consider those qualities a tremendous force, a tremendous strength in our lives. And a good deal of my work around the teaching of loving kindness as a method of meditation is around countering some of those notions that we might have. People say all of the time, I don't know about developing a more loving heart. Were I to get more loving, then I would just allow people to hurt me. And I would allow people to hurt others or oppress others. And I wouldn't take a stand. I wouldn't be strong. I had seen an interview many, many years ago in uh, some magazine with Ms. Kentucky, a former beauty queen. Her reign had been like 30 years before. But all these years later, she was asked, what do you have to say about life? And she said, I'm so tired. I'm so tired of smiling. And I thought, okay, 30 years of just smiling for the camera, completely disconnected to whatever her inner state actually was just placing this kind of veneer on her experience. And, and that's what a lot of people think of, I find, when they hear a term like loving kindness or compassion. Loving kindness is actually the literal translation of a word in Pali, the language of the original Buddhist text. The word is metta, M-E-T-T-A, usually translated as loving kindness. It means friendship. And I usually translate it as connection. I think it means a profound connection to our inner strengths that may not be so apparent to us and to others because we can live as though we were all alone and cut off. But the truth is that we live in an interconnected universe. It's like each of you right now 
if you just reflect for a few moments, who comes to mind as having played some role in your being here right now? Right? Because those of you who are here physically probably were not just driving by and saw these people coming in and thought, I think I'll go in there. We're here because of conversations we've had. Somebody gave us a book. Somebody talked about their yoga practice. Somebody talked about their meditation practice. Somebody challenged us. Somebody helped wake us up. So just see who comes to mind. This moment in time is actually like a confluence of all this connection that brings us here together right now. And so is every moment in time. We, we actually live in a world that is completely interdependent, interconnected. And it's not fanciful, it's not sentimental, it's not even always very pleasant, but it is, it's true. Science teaches us this, economics teaches us this, environmental consciousness teaches us this, even epidemiology teaches us this, that what happens over there doesn't nicely stay over there. It ripples out over here. And what we do, where we put our energy, what we care about, it matters, because it too will ripple out. But that's just the nature of, of life. And that really is the spirit of loving kindness. Doesn't mean you like everybody. It actually doesn't even mean you like anybody. <laughs> but we know deep, deep down, our lives have something to do with one another. We recognize something in one another. I was once teaching in uh, Washington, DC, in a school that had been rented because it was the weekend. And this particular school, an elementary school, had its own rules of kindness. So these rules of kindness were all over the walls and the corridors. And whenever we took a break, we would go and we would just like look at the walls because they were so great. And the rules were things like, don't hurt anyone on the inside or on the outside. And my very favorite rule of kindness was, everybody gets to play. Everybody gets to play. Doesn't mean you like everybody, it doesn't mean you're gonna take everyone home and be your best friend, but everybody gets to play. It's that kind of fundamental sense of respect that is the spirit of loving kindness. So traditionally, loving kindness is taught with three other qualities. It's talked about in the context of three other qualities as well. And I think that gives us a real sense of how we use it in good times, wonderful times, great times, difficult times, challenging times, and everything in between. The first quality is loving kindness itself, that, that sense of connection. The second quality is compassion which is talked about as the trembling or the quivering of the heart in response to seeing pain or suffering. It's actually a movement of our hearts. Loving kindness is often said to be based on the recognition or the belief that everybody wants to be happy. We all actually want to be happy. We want a sense of belonging. We want a sense of being part of something greater than our limited sense of who we are. But we get so confused, we get so many messages about where happiness is to be found. So we're lost in a way. But the problem is ignorance. It's really not understanding. It's not that urge toward happiness, which we all share. So in some ways, it's almost like thinking everybody deserves to be happy. Everybody gets to play, right? And compassion is said to be based on a recognition of, of just the vulnerability of life. It's not that we all have the same measure of suffering, because clearly we don't, but life itself is so fragile, it's so vulnerable. We all share a kind of insecurity. 
So we don't look at somebody who's having a tough time as though to say, well, I, who have this perfect life and am immune to any problems, I'm going to bestow this kindness on you way down there because uh, your life has fallen apart, which mine never could. But there's more that kind of equality, like, ooh, life is so changeable. For any one of us, we could pick up our cell phones and call into our messages, and by the time we hang up that phone, we have a different life than the one we had before. So there's a movement, there's a kind of tenderness of our hearts as we look at our own pain or difficulty, as we look at the difficulty of others. And then there is a third quality, which is called sympathetic joy, which means joy in the happiness of others. If compassion teaches us a better way to look at our own pain and pain of others, sympathetic joy or joy in the happiness of others teaches us a better way to look at joy. So sympathetic joy actually means not falling sway to the voice that so often arises when we witness someone's success or good fortune, that voice that says, ooh, I wish you had a little bit less going for you right now. Like, you don't have to lose everything, but if the light could just dim a bit, I'd feel happier. Instead, we actually can rejoice in the happiness of others. We don't feel threatened. We don't feel something's been taken away from us or stolen from us. And in order to really enhance that sense of caring, of delight, in someone else's joy, first of all, we need to have some sense of sufficiency or even abundance. If we fall into, I have nothing, and you have everything, it's going to be very hard to feel this kind of joy for someone else. So we need to pay some attention to what we do have. We need to practice gratitude. To realize we may not have everything we want, but at the very least, we're breathing, right? We have capacity for growth, for change. We need to realize happiness is actually not a limited commodity in this world. And the more someone else has, the less there's going to be for me. Right, and remove ourselves from that, that way of thinking. And challenge some of those assumptions about aloneness, about happiness. And then the fourth quality, after loving kindness, compassion, and sympathetic joy, which is really key to the kind of broadening of loving kindness in all of them through all kinds of different circumstances, is this quality called equanimity which means balance. It's the kind of balance that's born of wisdom. Wisdom tells us what we can do and what we can't do. Wisdom actually gives us some healthy kinds of boundaries. Wisdom gives us patience, right? Maybe someone is not going to heal on our timetable. Things won't change according to our demand. It doesn't mean we do nothing. It means we do everything that we can. And we need to have a kind of letting go also. Because ultimately, this is not our universe to control. I often had like too bad, you know, but it's so. We try and we work and we help and we care and we love and that all needs to be in a perspective of wisdom or we burn out, we're frustrated, we feel helpless, we cannot bear feeling helpless, we turn away, we feel powerless, we resent that, we resent others, we decide compassion is too exhausting. We need equanimity because we need, we need the, the texture, the flavor, the, the permeating of wisdom throughout everything. Wisdom tells us, I will care, and I will try, and 
since I'm not in control in the end. I can't make it so. It's not my fault. Or life is full of ups and downs. The way they put it in the Buddhist tradition is there's pleasure and pain and gain and loss, praise and blame, fame and disrepute. These are called the eight vicissitudes. These are not unnatural. These are not weird. It's just the nature of things. Sometimes people think, well, you know, if I get really good at a spiritual pursuit, it'll all kind of flatten out. There won't be any more highs, but that's okay because there won't be any more lows. It'll just be this kind of gray amorphous blob that my life will turn into. And some people actually do long for that and other people dread it, but it never happens anyway. So it kind of doesn't matter how you feel about it. That's not what a spiritual journey is about. We experience everything because life has everything and we can be different with it. Instead of going up and then clinging and holding on and craving and thinking, oh, you know, I've got to make this last forever. We can enjoy it and be free. And instead of going down and having challenge, difficulty, adversity, and adding shame and guilt and bitterness and anger and fear, we can have compassion for ourselves and others as things are difficult. And all those places in between that aren't so great and they aren't so hard, the neutral, ordinary, repetitive, routine sort of experiences that we have every day, those are the times we usually go to sleep and we kind of numb out and we disconnect. But we can be really connected to ourselves and to one another. Even in that neutral space, we discover we can be different with everything and everybody. We have to understand that life is full of pleasure and pain and gain and loss and praise and blame and fame and disrepute for everybody. Some years ago, I was um, walking, uh, we were hiking, these friends and I, uh, in California, and we decided we were gonna go into this state park along a certain trail for three days. And then on the fourth day, we were gonna turn around and come back out on the very same trail. So this was still the third day when we were walking in. And it turned out to be a day of many, many hours of really constant, steady, unremitting downhill walking. And at one point, this friend I was with and I, it's like we were struck by this simultaneous realization and we both just stopped. And we looked at each other and he said to me, in a dualistic universe, downhill can only mean one thing. <laughs> and sure enough, the next day, when we turned around to come back out, it was many, many, many hours a very constant uphill walking. So I'm not positing that every level of the universe is dualistic, but on the level in which we feel pleasure and pain and so on, we feel both. It's like that. And so we can have equanimity, which doesn't mean kind of sullenness or indifference, it means peace. We can be at peace with the way things are. And that will tremendously strengthen our loving kindness. It will tremendously strengthen our compassion. It will tremendously strengthen our sympathetic joy. And we take those qualities with us wherever we go, as we go up and as we go down. And then maybe the last thing I'll say before we actually practice together is that this is, these are really seen as a practice. And sometimes I find in the West, that's considered a little bit strange. If you say, I'm cultivating loving kindness, I'm strengthening compassion, I'm training compassion, it can sound really kind of cold and mechanistic, like that's a little odd. But in Eastern psychology or, or in Buddhist psychology, absolutely it's believed these things can be trained. Not in a cold and weird sense, but because they are based in awareness and we know awareness can be trained. How we pay attention can be trained. 
if you're the kind of person, for example, who at the end of the day, you look back at your day almost as though to evaluate yourself, like how'd I do today? And let's say you're the kind of person who pretty well only remembers the mistakes you made and the things you did wrong and what you didn't like about yourself, let's just say. So much so that your whole sense of who you are and all that you will ever be just collapses around that really stupid thing you said at lunch at the meeting. We need to open beyond that, right? I mean, all that may be true, but that's not the only truth. What went right today? What's the good within me? What's the good that came forth toward me? So what do we pay attention to? Can it be bigger and more inclusive than what it usually is? And who do we pay attention to? Who doesn't get to play? Who doesn't count? Who do we look right through instead of look at? Who do we ignore? Who do we discount or disregard? And what happens if we include them rather than look right through them? That's a practice. It's a practice of awareness. And how fragmented are we in our awareness? If you're having a conversation with somebody, are you actually really listening? Or are you thinking about the 50 emails you need to write? And what's going to happen if my plane is late? And all of that. So can we get there and actually be really present in a wholehearted way? If we look at who we pay attention to, how we pay attention, what we pay attention to, and we continue to grow and expand in those realms, what will come almost as emergent properties, like you're growing a garden and you've planted the seeds, what will come alive are qualities like loving kindness and compassion and sympathetic joy and equanimity. So absolutely these things can be considered a kind of practice. Okay.